discussion on the role of adenosine in atrial fibrillation. First and foremost, it must be remembered that adenosine is not to be given in atrial fibrillation if there is an atrioventricular bypass tract like Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. This is because adenosine slows conduction through the AV node but does not affect the accessory pathway. Secondly, adenosine can rarely induce atrial fibrillation and very rarely ventricular fibrillation. This aspect has been covered in two other videos in this channel. Adenosine guided pulmonary vein ablation has been studied as adenosine might identify pulmonary veins at risk of reconnection by unmasking dormant conduction. Identifying dormant conduction will guide additional ablation to potentially improve the results of catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. Advice trial on this aspect was a randomized study at 18 hospitals across Australia, Europe and North America. Adenosine was administered intravenously after pulmonary vein isolation in symptomatic paroxysmal AF in which one antiarrhythmic drug had failed. If dormant conduction was identified, patients were randomized to additional adenosine-guided ablation to abolish dormant conduction or to no further ablation. Patients were masked to treatment allocation. Those in whom no dormant conduction was revealed, randomly selected patients were included in a registry. Primary outcome measure was symptomatic atrial tachyarrhythmia after single procedure in the intention to treat population. Adenosine unmasked dormant pulmonary vein conduction in 284 of the 534 patients. 102 of the 147 with adenosine guided ablation were free from symptomatic atrial tachyarrhythmia compared to 58 of the 137 patients with no further ablation. Of the 115 patients without dormant pulmonary vein conduction included in the registry, 64 remained free of symptomatic atrial tachyarrhythmia. Similar occurrences of serious adverse events were noted in each of the groups. Death due to massive stroke deemed probably related to ablation occurred in one patient included in the registry. Others suggested that adenosine testing to identify dormant conduction should become part of routine clinical practice. Under ATP trial randomized 2,113 patients with paroxysmal, persistent or long-standing atrial fibrillation to either ATP-guided pulmonary vein isolation or conventional pulmonary vein isolation. Primary endpoint was recurrent atrial tachyarrhythmias lasting 30 seconds or more or those requiring repeat ablation, hospital admission or usage of von William class 1 or 3 antiarrhythmic drugs at one year. Blanking period was for 90 days after ablation. There was no significant difference in the primary endpoint at one year. Others concluded that no significant reduction in recurrent atrial tachyarrhythmias with ATP guided pulmonary vein ablation compared to conventional pulmonary vein isolation was found. A couple of meta-analysis evaluated this aspect. One of them identified 3524 patients and another 4099 patients. Both these meta-analysis concluded that additional ablation aiming to eliminate adenosine-induced transient pulmonary vein reconnection failed to reduce risk of AF recurrence at follow-up. Additional studies to find out the actual role of adenosine in pulmonary vein isolation are needed. Discussion on admixture lesions in cyanotic congenital heart disease. Admixture lesions are cyanotic congenital heart diseases with near equal saturations in aorta and pulmonary artery. They include total anomalous pulmonary venous connection, total anomalous systemic venous connection, single atrium, tricuspid atresia, single ventricle, 
trungus arteriosus. In these lesions, there is chance for complete mixing of both systemic and pulmonary venous return so that final mixed sample is delivered to both aorta and pulmonary artery so that their saturations are near equal. In TAPVC, the mixing occurs in the right atrium while in TASVC, it occurs in the left atrium. In single atrium, single ventricle and trungus arteriosus, the admixture occurs in the corresponding regions. In normal individuals, systemic circulation and pulmonary circulation are in series so that there is no admixture of deoxygenated blood except for the small amount of blood less than 3% which drains the bronchial veins into the pulmonary veins. In CCHD with admixture physiology, a cardiac defect facilitates complete mixing of deoxygenated systemic venous blood and oxygenated pulmonary venous blood in a common receiving chamber. If the cardiac index is within the normal range, effective saturation of blood after completed admixture will be related to the amount of oxygenated blood coming from the lungs. Hence, the systemic arterial saturation will reflect the pulmonary blood flow in an admixture lesion. Often, the mixing in the common chamber is not complete and can result in different saturations in pulmonary artery and aorta. If the pulmonary venous return streams preferentially into the aorta, it is known as favorable streaming as aortic saturation will be higher. If pulmonary venous return streams selectively into the pulmonary artery, it is unfavorable streaming as aortic saturation will be lower. Typical examples for both these types of streaming can be drawn from different types of TAPVC. In supracardiac TAPVC draining into superior vena cava, the pulmonary venous return can stream selectively to the tricuspid valve, right atrium, right ventricle and pulmonary artery. This constitutes unfavorable streaming. In infradiaphragmatic TAPVC draining into inferior vena cava, streaming can occur selectively to the left atrium across the atrial septal defect. This will be favorable streaming. Discussion on balloon mitral valvotomy, also known as percutaneous transmitral commissurotomy. Balloon mitral valvotomy is usually done for severe symptomatic mitral stenosis with a pliable mitral valve without significant calcification. Wilkins echocardiographic score is useful in deciding suitability of valve for BMV and has been covered in a previous video on this channel. BMV is done by a femoral approach through the femoral vein. Left femoral arterial axis is also taken to place a pigtail in the aorta for guiding intraatrial septal puncture. Transeptal catheterization is done using broken bro needle. Monitoring of needle tip pressure guides confirmation of left atrial entry. This is further confirmed by injection of a small quantity of contrast. Coil tip guide wire is introduced after heparinization. BMV catheter assembly is introduced after that. For final details of the procedure, please refer the journal reference given. Screenshot of the fluoroscopic image showing the balloon mitral valvotomy balloon across the intraatrial septum in the left atrium. The left atrial pigtail guide wire is also protruding out of the deflated balloon in the left atrium. Pigtail wire prevents the balloon tip from injuring the left atrial roof while passing across the intraatrial septum into the left atrium. Perforation of left atrial roof is a rare complication. This screenshot shows the deflated balloon in the left ventricle. The guide wire has been removed. The stillet which was introduced prior to entry into the left ventricle to curve the balloon assembly to facilitate LV entry has been partially withdrawn to minimize trauma to the left ventricle. Presence of the stillet will increase the stiffness of the assembly and increase the trauma to the left ventricle in systole while the balloon is in the left ventricle. Initial partial inflation of the balloon causes the distal half of the dumbbell shaped BMV balloon to expand first. The distal half is tugged against the mitral valve 
by pulling back the shaft to ensure correct position for inflation. During proper tugging, the arterial pressure tracing will show a dip due to obstruction to LV inflow. Once the position across the mitral valve is sure, the balloon is fully inflated to produce splitting of the fused commissures and release of the mitral valve obstruction. During full inflation, the arterial pressure drops to zero and if the inflation is prolonged, the subject may feel giddiness. After full inflation of the balloon, once the commissures have given away, the inflated balloon usually slips back into the left atrium. The balloon is rapidly deflated to avoid prolonged obstruction to the LV inflow. The stillet is removed and the left atrial pressure checked to see the effectiveness of dilatation in terms of reduction of left atrial pressure. The pigtail catheter from the iota which was used to guide the septal puncture can be introduced back into the left ventricle to measure the left ventricular diastolic pressure and thus calculate the transmital gradient. Elevation of left ventricular end diastolic pressure or undue prominence of left atrial V wave must make one suspect significant mitral regurgitation following metal valvotomy. Discussion on Brugada syndrome genes Brugada syndrome is a genetic disorder characterized by right bundle branch block pattern with ST segment elevation and T wave inversion in right precordial leads. Life threatening ventricular arrhythmias are the hallmark of Brugada syndrome. The disorder was described by Brugada brothers Pedro, Joseph, and Ramon in 1992. Later, genetic defect was noted in the sodium channel gene. SCN5A. Patients with Brugada syndrome may sometimes present with electrical storm. Medical treatment is generally unsatisfactory for Brugada syndrome. Drugs like quinidine and silostazole have been useful in reducing the number of episodes of ventricular tachyarrhythmia. Those with previous cardiac arrest, especially with a family history of sudden cardiac death, need to be protected by an implantable cardiovascular defibrillator. Here is a typical Brugada syndrome ECG from our earlier publication. Coming back to genes in Brugada syndrome, the first gene abnormality described in SCN5A gene has been designated as Brugada syndrome 1. Brugada 2 was described as defect in the GPD1L gene. The genetic defect in Brugada 3 is localized to the calcium channel gene CACNA1C. Brugada 4 has an abnormality in another calcium channel gene CACNB2. Brugada 5 has sodium channel defect in SCN1B. Potassium channel KCNE3 is defective in Brugada 6. Sodium channel SCN3B is defective in Brugada 7. HCN4 defect characterizes Brugada 8. Mutation in KCND3 has been designated as Brugada 9. This is the list of designated Brugada syndrome 1 to 9 from the OMIM database on NCBI. But an article by Brugada R and Associates lists 23 genes. Discussion on carbon dioxide angiography Arteriogram using carbon dioxide injection Usual angiograms appear dark while this is grey because of the lower density of carbon dioxide compared to tissue. Conventional angiogram is shown beside the carbon dioxide angiogram for comparison of opacification. Please note that the angiograms are not in the same projection. Carbon dioxide angiography is resorted to in cases of renal failure. Iodinated contrast has the risk of contrast induced acute kidney injury, more so in those with pre existing renal insufficiency. Earlier, those with renal issues were considered for magnetic resonance angiography, which is also called dialysis angiography, 
as blood vessels can be visualized with contrast obtained from moving hydrogen nuclei in water, an important constituent of blood. For better visualization, gadolinium based contrasts are often used in magnetic resonance angiography. Gadolinium based contrasts have been associated with nephrogenic systemic sclerosis in those with renal failure. Hence the role of carbon dioxide angiography in those with renal failure as carbon dioxide is devoid of any such toxicity. As CO2 is highly soluble in blood and rapidly cleared from circulation, it is ideally suited as a negative contrast agent in those with renal failure. Technique of CO2 angiography is a little more cumbersome than contrast angiography. We need medical grade carbon dioxide cylinder, three-way stopcocks, connected tubings, syringes and a reservoir bag for interim storage of carbon dioxide. Initially, the reservoir bag is connected to the CO2 cylinder and CO2 drawn into it multiple times to flush out room air present in it. After that, the bag can be connected to the angiographic manifold attached to the proximal end of the catheter for CO2 injection. High flow rates can cause mesenteric ischemia due to vapor lock which can be managed by rotating the patient side to side and gently massaging the abdomen. Carbon dioxide angiography is an alternative in those with contrast allergy as carbon dioxide is non-allergenic. Carbon dioxide angiography should not be used for cerebral vessels and injections should be below the level of the diaphragm. That would mean that it cannot be used in the thoracic aorta or for coronary angiography. Many of the complications of carbon dioxide angiography are at least partly contributed to by contamination with room air. Occasional reports of fatality following carbon dioxide angiography prompted a study on the safety. A retrospective study of 951 patients who underwent 1007 carbon dioxide digital subtraction angiography procedures over a 21 year period has been reported. 632 were arterial procedures which included 527 iotograms, 100 extremity arteriograms and 5 pulmonary arteriograms, 187 inferior vena cavograms, 182 hepatic or visceral venograms, 5 extremity venograms and 1 superior vena cavogram were the venous procedures. Associated endovascular procedures were done in 499 cases. Of the four deaths in the series, one was due to separative pancreatitis following iotogram and another with hepatic bleed following failed transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt. Another was due to metastatic carcinoma and one due to refractory end-stage cardiomyopathy. A randomized study has been conducted on quality and safety of automated carbon dioxide DSA in femoropopliteal lesions. All the 50 patients in the study underwent both iodinated contrast media and carbon dioxide angiography for the same target lesion. Inter-rater agreement was fair to excellent for overall image quality. It was fair to excellent for visibility of collaterals and poor to excellent for assessment of stenosis or occlusions. Adverse events noted were hematoma in two patients, pain related to puncture in one and nausea and vomiting in another. Some of the indications for carbon dioxide angiography are 1. Abdominal iotography 2. Renal transplant arteriography 3. Visualization of portal vein with wedged hepatic venous injection 4 for guiding endovascular procedures. Discussion on the clinical importance of left bundle branch block. Left bundle branch block is usually associated with structural heart disease unlike right bundle branch block which may be seen without associated heart disease. LBBB is one cause for paradoxical splitting of second heart sound. Normal split closes in expiration.
in paradoxical splitting split is audible in expiration and closes in inspiration in normal conduction sequence left bundle branch block is activated first hence a left bundle branch block can affect the initial vector in the ecg this leads to errors in interpretation of q waves in myocardial infarction secondary st segment and t wave abnormalities common with lbbb makes assessment of myocardial ischemia difficult both at rest and during exercise testing various criteria have been proposed for diagnosis of myocardial infarction in the presence of lbbb of which scarbosa criteria is most popular other criteria described are selvester 10% rs criteria and smith 25% s wave criteria lbbb has great significance in the setting of left ventricular dysfunction dyssynchrony of left ventricular contraction characteristic of lbbb can worsen heart failure that is why cardiac resynchronization therapy aims at reducing the dyssynchrony in those with symptomatic heart failure benefits of cardiac resynchronization therapy in heart failure is largely restricted to those with lbbb and qrs with 150 milliseconds or more suggesting the role of left ventricular dyssynchrony in heart failure progression responders to cardiac resynchronization therapy which constitutes 2/3 of the patients exhibit left ventricular reverse remodeling they also show reduction in qrs width on resynchronization all cause mortality was significantly lower in responders both his bundle pacing and left bundle branch pacing have been used for correction of dyssynchrony lbbb correction is a terminology used by some this results in normal qrs and left ventricular synchronization his bundle pacing helps by pacing the fibers distant to the left bundle branch within the his bundle it is known that the fibers segregate before the actual division into left and right bundle branches lbbb can interfere with echocardiographic interpretation due to the associated abnormalities in left ventricular wall motion in lbbb there is a pre ejection contraction with leftward movement of the septum followed by immediate rebound stretch and subsequent paradoxical rightward movement this has also been called as septal flash please note that septal flash is different from the respirophasic ventricular septal shift known as septal bounce in constrictive pericarditis septal flash is early systolic while septal bounce is early diastolic LBBB often causes septal perfusion defects in radionuclide myocardial perfusion imaging during exercise test but this is rare with vasodilator stress a study comparing 10 patients with LBBB 10 age matched controls and 10 pacemaker patients with right ventricular pacing off and down has been reported they concluded that the apparent septal perfusion defect in LBBB is mainly due to relative lateral hypoperfusion rather than an absolute decrease in septal flow switching pacemaker on during exercise decrease the ratio of septal to lateral wall myocardial blood flow by 17% septal perfusion defect is partly due to the heterogeneity in blood flow between left anterior descending and left circumflex coronary arteries due to the delayed septal relaxation it may be noted that myocardial blood flow is better in diastole when myocardium relaxes as the systolic contraction reduces blood flow in systole into the intramyocardial vessels there may be a reduced oxygen demand due to the late septal contraction which occurs when the wall stress is less discussion on electrosurgery in patients with pacemakers and icds
electrosurgical equipment uses radio frequency energy in the range of 0.1 to 5 megahertz. This can cause electromagnetic interference with pacemakers and other cardiac implantable electronic devices. In general, if the use of cautery is below the umbilicus, with the indifferent electrode patch kept beneath the thighs, the chance of interference with the thoracic CIED is unlikely. Electrosurgical equipment can have unipolar and bipolar modes of operation, the former being more frequently available. In unipolar mode, the current flows from the cautery tip to the indifferent electrode kept behind the body. In bipolar mode, the current flows between two electrodes at the tip of the cautery probe. Bipolar mode is safer in the presence of a pacemaker, less likely to cause EMI. Maximum chance of EMI is when the cautery is used within 8 cm of the CIED. If there is indifference noted with the device during the procedure, like inhibition of a pacemaker, using cautery in short bursts will be useful to prevent life-threatening asystole. Another option is to reposition the ground electrode of the electrosurgical equipment to redirect the current path away from the implanted device. Pacemakers are programmed to asynchronous mode and implantable cardioverter defibrillator tachyarrhythmia therapies are suspended prior to surgery if interference is likely. If the patient is not pacemaker dependent, Pacemaker can be programmed to a low backup pacing rate in addition. CIED programming is done before and after the surgical procedure to ensure proper functioning of the device. If device programmer is not available in an emergency, taping a magnet over the device will suspend ICD shocks and switch the pacemaker to asynchronous mode. Magnet can be removed after the surgery to resume normal function. Discussion on host exam trial on clopidogrel versus aspirin in post PCI with death patients for maintenance therapy. Host exam trial was an investigator initiated prospective randomized open label multi center trial. The study had 37 sites in South Korea. It was a head to head comparison of efficacy and safety of aspirin and clopidogrel as monotherapy during chronic maintenance therapy in patients who underwent coronary stenting. The highlight of host exam trial was that it showed that clopidogrel monotherapy was superior to aspirin monotherapy as chronic maintenance therapy among patients who have completed the required dual antiplatelet therapy after PCI with DES implantation. The study enrolled patients who were on dual antiplatelet therapy for 6 to 18 months after PCI with DES without clinical events. Those who had any ischemic or major bleeding complications were excluded. Patients were randomly assigned to clopidogrel 75 mg or aspirin 100 mg once daily for 24 months. Primary composite endpoint included all cause mortality non-fatal myocardial infarction, stroke, readmission due to acute coronary syndrome and bark bleeding type 3 or greater. It was an intention to treat analysis. 5,438 patients were randomized and ascertainment of the primary endpoint was completed in 5,338 patients. Primary outcome occurred in 5.7% patients in the clopidogrel group and 7.7% in the aspirin group. All-cause mortality was 1.9% in clopidogrel group versus 1.3% in aspirin group, which was not statistically significant. Non-fatal myocardial infarction was 0.7% versus 1.0%, which was also not statistically significant. Stroke occurred in 0.7% of the clopidogrel group and 1.0% of the aspirin group, which was statistically significant. Readmission with acute coronary syndrome was 2.5% versus 4.1%, which was also statistically significant. Secondary thrombotic outcome was a composite of cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, readmission for ACS, 
and stent thrombosis. It was 3.7% in clopidogrel group versus 5.5% in aspirin group. Secondary bleeding outcome was any bleeding which was 2.3% with clopidogrel and 3.3% with aspirin. The authors concluded that in patients requiring indefinite antiplatelet monotherapy after PCI, clopidogrel monotherapy was superior to aspirin in preventing future adverse events. One important limitation while generalizing the data for global population is the geographic limit of the study which was conducted in one country. Open label nature of the study is another obvious disadvantage. Clopidogrel resistance was not assessed in the study. This study is hypothesis generating and calls for a multinational double blind comparison on a larger scale to get a better conclusion on long term antiplatelet monotherapy after PCI with DES. A somewhat similar disadvantage for aspirin was suggested in the Augustus trial among patients with atrial fibrillation and recent ACS or PCI. Adding apixaban to P2Y12 inhibitor resulted in lower bleeding compared with vitamin K antagonist and a lower rate of death or rehospitalization. Addition of aspirin resulted in greater bleeding without any difference in efficacy. 92.6% of patients in that study was on clopidogrel at randomization while only 1.1% was on prasugrel and 6.2% on ticagrelor. But in the Augustus trial, there was no head-to-head -head comparison of aspirin versus clopidogrel or any other P2Y12 inhibitor. There was an aspirin versus placebo comparison while there was no P2Y12 inhibitor versus placebo comparison. Discussion on idarocizumab for reversal of direct thrombin inhibitor dabigatran. Idarocizumab is a monoclonal antibody fragment used to reverse the anticoagulant effect of direct thrombin inhibitor dabigatran. Reverse early clinical trial evaluated the safety and efficacy of 5 gram idarocizumab given intravenously. An interim analysis of 90 patients was published first. In that report, 51 patients in group A of the study had serious bleeding, while 39 patients in group B required an urgent procedure. Primary endpoint of the study was the maximum percentage reversal of the anticoagulant effect of dabigatran within 4 hours of administration of idarocizumab. This was determined using dilute thrombin time or a current clotting time. Important secondary endpoint was restoration of hemostasis. Authors of the interim report concluded that idarocizumab completely reversed the anticoagulant effect of dabigatran within minutes. One thrombotic event occurred within three days in a patient in whom anticoagulant had not been restarted. Major limitation of the study was lack of a control group but it was deemed unethical to have a control group in patients evaluated who were having either a life-threatening bleeding or need for urgent surgery. Darosusimab has an affinity for dabigatran that is about 350 times stronger than its affinity for thrombin. Darosusimab does not bind non-thrombin substrates and has no activity in coagulation tests or platelet aggregation. Darosusimab binds free as well as thrombin bound dabigatran and neutralizes its activity. Full cohort analysis of the reverse AD trial had 503 patients, 301 in group A and 202 in group B. 45.5% of the patients in group A had gastrointestinal bleeding at presentation while 32.6% had intracranial hemorrhage. Among those patients who could be assessed, the median time to cessation of bleeding was 2.5 hours. In group B, the median time to the initiation of the intended procedure was 1.6 hours. Periprocedural hemostasis was normal in 93.4% of the patients. 90-day thrombotic event rate was 0.5%.
6.3% in group A and 7.4% in group B. Mortality rate was 18.8% and 18.9% respectively in the two groups. No serious safety adverse signals were documented in the study. Recurrent elevation of clotting time mainly between 12 to 24 hours after treatment was noted in 114 patients. This was probably due to redistribution of unborn dabigatran from the extravascular compartment to the intravascular compartment. But this elevation was associated with bleeding in only 10 patients. Others suggested that among patients with a recurrent elevation in clotting time, only those with new onset or recurrent bleeding should be considered for a second dose of idarosizumab. Enrolled patients were elderly, had numerous comorbidities and presented with serious index events such as intracranial hemorrhage, multiple trauma, sepsis, acute abdomen or open fracture. These could account for the significant mortality noted in both groups. Others attribute the thrombotic events to the low rate of reinitiation of anticoagulation, particularly in group A. Idarosizumab has a half-life of 45 minutes and all thrombotic events in the study within 72 hours occurred in patients in whom anticoagulation had not been restarted. Thrombotic events which occurred later are likely to be due to the underlying prothrombotic state rather than the effect of dabigatran reversal. A sub-study of reverse AD trial reported more details of the 137 patients who presented with gastrointestinal bleeding. 84% of these were major or life-threatening. 35% of them had upper GI bleed while 31.4% had lower GI bleed. 33.6% had either both or unknown origin bleeds. Bleeding stopped within 24 hours in 68.7% of the evaluable patients after a median duration of 2.4 hours. Discussion on identification of culprit vessel or infarct artery localization. Have a look at this ECG and the associated angiogram. The ECG shows ST segment elevation in leads 2, 3 and AVF of about 3 mm. ST segment depression is seen in leads 1 AVL and V1 to V5. Overall features are suggestive of Hyperacute phase of inferior wall myocardial infarction with reciprocal ST segment depression in anterior leads. Left coronary angiogram shows total occlusion of distal left circumflex coronary artery with absent dye filling in a short segment, black arrow. Multiple significant lesions are seen in left anterior descending coronary artery, blue arrows. Significant lesions are also seen in the obtuse marginal branch of the left circumflex coronary artery, yellow arrows. The culprit lesion which has caused the infarction in this case is possibly the left circumflex occlusion. Generally, the ST elevation is more in lead 3 in right coronary occlusion while it is more in lead 2 in left circumflex occlusion. In this case, we have almost equal ST elevation in leads 2 and 3. But the discussion does not stop there. Right coronary angiogram shows a critical lesion, black arrow, with some negative shadows distilled to the lesion, suggesting thrombus. We may be tempted to believe that this is the culprit lesion which has caused the inferior wall infarction if the LCX lesion was not found. This case demonstrates a limitation of localization of culprit vessel from ECG. Here is another similar ECG, but there is mild ST elevation in V5 and V6 in addition to inferior ST elevation, which makes left circumflex lesion more likely. AVL shows minimal ST depression, so does V1 and V2. In this ECG, ST segment elevation and T-wave inversion are present in 2, 3 and AVF 
the inferior leads. The ST segment is coved and T waves are inverted in V5 and V6, the lateral leads. Minimal ST segment depression is seen in lead 1 and AVL, which can be taken as reciprocal to the ST elevation in inferior leads. There are tall R waves in V1 and V2 with R by S ratio more than 1 and ST segment depression with upright T waves. These features are suggestive of posterior wall infarction being the inverse of Q wave ST elevation and T wave inversion which would have been recorded in a posterior lead. There is also loss of R wave amplitude in V5, V6. Together with the changes in inferior and lateral leads, the full diagnosis is inferior posterior and lateral wall infarction. This combination can occur in occlusion of a dominant left circumflex coronary artery which supplies the inferior posterior and lateral walls of the left ventricle. The angiograms discussed in the first case had an occlusion of a dominant left circumflex coronary artery. Right coronary artery was small and non-dominant. The full extent of supply by the left circumflex can only be seen after opening the occlusion. Left coronary angiogram showing dominant left circumflex with left posterior descending artery arising from it. Here it is a non-dominant left circumflex and it gives only obtuse marginal branches and no LPDA. This is how a dominant RCA will look like much larger and giving rise to posterior descending and posterior left ventricular branches. Right ventricular branches are also seen. If there is a proximal occlusion, inferior wall infarction is associated with right ventricular infarction. RV infarction manifests with ST elevation in right precordial leads. Right precordial ST elevation can also occur in anterior wall myocardial infarction due to left anterior descending coronary artery occlusion. But in LAD occlusion, ST elevation in V2 is more than that in V1. In right ventricular infarction, more ST elevation is noted in V3R than in V1. V1 can show ST elevation in both these cases. Now what about this ECG? ECG shows sinus rhythm at around 100 per minute with ST segment elevation in AVR and V1. ST depression is seen in 1, 2, 3, AVF, V3 to V5. Maximum ST depression is noted in V4 and V5 and it is down sloping. Duration of ST elevation in AVR is more than that in V1. Overall, it is likely to be due to left main coronary artery disease. Alternate option is proximal multivessel coronary stenosis. But proximal left anterior descending coronary artery stenosis should have produced some ST elevation in V2. Here, ST segment is isoelectric in V2. This is another ECG from a person with persistent anginal pain for the past several hours showing significant ST segment depression in anterolateral leads along with sinus tachycardia. ST segment elevation is noted in AVR. Such a pattern is consistent with significant left main coronary artery stenosis. Clinical evaluation and x-ray chest showed features of pulmonary edema. Angiography done after initial stabilization with intensive medical management showed severe stenosis of distal left main coronary artery along with multiple lesions in all the three vessels. Classical ECG pattern in left main coronary artery disease is ST segment elevation in AVR with extensive ST depression in other leads, most prominent in 1, 2 and V4 to V6. ST elevation may be noted in V1, but ST elevation in AVR is more than or equal to that in V1. This ECG shows ST elevation in AVR and V1 along with ST depression in inferior and lateral leads. ST elevation in AVR is more than that in V1, also suggestive of left main disease. In addition to ST elevation in AVR, this ECG also shows Q in V1 followed by a tall slayed R, QRBBB, indicative of anterior wall infarction with right bundle branch block. The initial R of the RSR prime pattern expected in right bundle branch block is knocked off by the infarction. Multiple supraventricular ectopics are also seen in the ECG. In a study comparing acute obstruction of left main 
left anterior descending and right coronary occlusions, AVR ST elevation of more than 0 0.05 millivolts was noted in 88% of LMCA obstruction, 43% of LAD obstruction and 8% of RCA obstruction. This is a left coronary angiogram focusing on the branches of left anterior descending coronary artery. Diagonal and septal branches are seen. ECG showing acute anterior wall myocardial infarction with RBBB. Gross ST segment elevation is seen in anterior leads with maximum 0.7 millivolt elevation in V4. QR pattern in V1 suggests anterior wall infarction with right bundle branch block. RBBB with an initial Q due to anterior wall infarction is called QRBBB and indicates proximal occlusion of left anterior descending coronary artery. Presence of QRBBB is associated with more extensive myocardial infarction and higher mortality. In a study, ST elevation in AVR, RBBB, ST depression in V5 and ST elevation in V1 more than 2.5 mm strongly suggested LAD occlusion proximal to first septal. Same study showed that abnormal Q wave in AVL was associated with occlusion proximal to first diagonal branch. Occlusion distal to D1 had ST depression in AVL. For both S1 and D1, inferior ST depression of 1 mm or more predicted proximal LAD occlusion and absence of it distal LAD occlusion. Sometimes a small area of myocardial infarction can present with ST elevation in 1 and AVL, sparing V5 and V6 which are seen usually together in lateral wall myocardial infarction. Such a small infarct has been called high lateral wall infarction. This ECG shows high lateral wall infarction with Q waves in 1 and AVL but not in V5 or V6. Code ST segment elevation minimal and shallow T wave inversion are seen in AVL. This could be due to occlusion of a diagonal branch of left anterior descending coronary artery or an obtuse marginal branch of the left circumflex coronary artery. Discussion on MELD score and MELD XI score. Model for end stage liver disease or MELD score is a logarithmic function of creatinine total bilirubin and international normalized ratio or INR. MELD score was originally developed to assess prognosis in patients undergoing transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunts for cirrhosis liver. Later, MELD score has been used in cardiovascular conditions like patients undergoing left ventricular assist device placement to operative transfusion requirements, morbidity and mortality. An important limitation for using MELD score in cardiovascular conditions is that the INR value does not indicate liver function in those receiving warfarin. Hence, a new score, MELD score excluding INR or MELD XI score was developed and validated. It is interesting to note that even this score was developed initially for potential liver transplant patients who needed anticoagulation so that INR cannot be included in the calculation of MELD score. MELD XI score has also been used to predict cardiac mortality and need for cardiac transplantation in long-term survivors of fondant surgery for congenital heart disease. Pictorial review of CRT implantation. CRT is cardiac resynchronization therapy, also known as biventricular pacing and heart failure device. Left subclavian venogram is usually the first step during the implantation of most cardiac implantable electronic devices. Alternated contrast is injected into a left forearm vein and the live fluoroscopy images captured for use as a roadmap during percutaneous subclavian vein puncture for the introduction of intracardiac leads of the device. Patient position on the table is not changed after acquisition of the venogram.
so that road map can be used for fluoroscopy guided subclavian vein puncture. Extra thoracic subclavian axillary vein puncture is very much facilitated by the venogram road map. Intra thoracic puncture is discouraged because of the chance of subclavian crush and long term damage to the pacing leads. Intra thoracic subclavian puncture has also a risk of pneumothorax as an occasional complication. The venogram is also useful to exclude anomalies and occlusion of the venous system prior to puncture. In case the veins are not found to be suitable, procedure is switched to the opposite side. Once the subclavian puncture has been obtained, the right ventricular pacing lead can be introduced and screwed into the desired location. Screwing to the interventricular septum is often preferred to an apical location. A steerable decapolar electrophysiology catheter introduced through a sheath is useful in guiding the sheath to the coronary sinus. Decapolar catheter can be removed once the sheath has been threaded well over it into the coronary sinus and seated well. Coronary sinus venogram can be obtained by injecting iodinated contrast into the coronary sinus through the sheath. Balloon occlusion of the proximal coronary sinus can improve the visualization of the coronary venous tree. A guide wire can be introduced slowly through the sheath in the coronary sinus and navigated to a good posterolateral vein visualized by the previous coronary sinus venogram. The left ventricular lead of the CRT device can be threaded over the guide wire in the posterolateral vein. The peel away sheath can be split using the device provided in the kit once a stable lead position has been obtained and tested. Atrial lead can be introduced and positioned in the right atrial appendage. Proximal ends of all leads are connected to the appropriate ports of the CRT device. Three leads are seen in the left subclavian vein. Tip of the atrial lead is seen in the lower right corner. Redundant lead loops and the CRT device are seen in the left upper corner. Final picture after implantation of a CRT device showing both ventricular leads, atrial lead and a part of the device in the upper left corner of the image. Now some CRT implantation pearls. Screw-in lead for LV pacing can be used only if the sheath can be taken deep into the vein as it is not introduced over guide wire. If after screwing in, the lead has a high impedance and the threshold is high, it is likely to be on the pericardial side of the vein. It may be unscrewed and another position sought. Screw tip is only 1 mm and may not produce significant bleeding on unscrewing from the pericardial side. Screwing to the myocardial side typically shows ST elevation on the lead tip electrogram due to the injury current. If threshold is not good, electronic configuration with pacing from proximal electrode or other combinations can be tried to improve efficacy. Issue with previous active fixation leads were that future removal or repositioning was not possible and they were also unipolar preventing electronic configuration of pacing. Unlike in conventional pacing, where we want to minimize ventricular pacing, in CRT, we want full biventricular pacing to occur. This may mean programming shorter AV delay to prevent intrinsic conduction. Inappropriately long AV delay can also cause a tendency for MR. Intraatrial conduction delay due to atrial fibrosis can increase AV delay. Atrial septal pacing is useful in reducing intraatrial conduction delay. Biatrial pacing is another option to synchronize the atrium. Drug therapy to slow AV conduction and prevent fusion is also useful to improve biventricular pacing in CRT. Echo guided optimization of AV delay is also possible. Ritter's method. During VV delay optimization, in some cases, an LV offset causing pre excitation of the LV may improve cardiac output. In interventricular dyssynchrony, RV ejects at LV and diastole. Intraventricular dyssynchrony is manifest as QRS onset to pulmonary ejection compared to aortic ejection of more than 40 milliseconds, septal to posterior wall delay of more than 160 milliseconds, or septal to lateral wall delay of more than 60 milliseconds in TVI.
ത്രീ ഡി സിംഗ്രണൈസേഷൻ ഈസ് വിത്ത് കളർ കോഡിംഗ് ഓഫ് ഏർലി ആൻഡ് ലൈറ്റ് കൺട്രാക്ടിംഗ് സെഗ്മെൻറ്റ്സ് ഏർലി ആസ് ഗ്രീൻ ആൻഡ് ലൈറ്റ് ആസ് റെഡ് മാക്സിമം ട്രാക്കിംഗ് റേറ്റ് ഹാസ് ടു ബി ഇൻക്രീസ്ഡ് ആസ് ഹാർട്ട് ഫെയിലിയർ സ്റ്റാറ്റസ് ഇംപ്രൂവ്സ് ദിസ് ഈസ് ഫോർ കൺസിസ്റ്റൻറ്റ് പേസിംഗ് അറ്റ് ഹയർ റേറ്റ്സ് നീഡഡ് ഡ്യൂറിംഗ് മോർ ആക്ടിവിറ്റീസ് പെർമിറ്റഡ് ബൈ ബെറ്റർ എഫേർട്ട് ടോളറൻസ് ട്രാൻഷൻ വേഴ്സനിങ് ഓഫ് റീനൽ ഫംഗ്ഷൻ മേ ബി സീൻ ആഫ്റ്റർ സി ആർ ടി ഇംപ്ലാൻറ്റേഷൻ ഡ്യൂ ടു ദി ലോങ് പ്രൊസീജിയർ ടൈം ദിസ് മേ ഓൾസോ കോസ് വേഴ്സനിങ് ഓഫ് ഹാർട്ട് ഫെയിലിയർ ദ ലോങ് എ പ്രൊസീജിയർ ടൈം ഓൾസോ എൻഹാൻസസ് ദ ചാൻസസ് ഫോർ ഇൻഫെക്ഷൻ സബ്ക്ലേവ് ഇൻ വെയിൻ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ഇസ് അനദർ പൊട്ടൻഷ്യൽ പ്രോബ്ലം ഡ്യൂ ടു ദ പ്രസൻസ് ഓഫ് ത്രീ ലീഡ്സ് ആൻഡ് എ സ്ലഗിഷ് സർക്കുലേഷൻ ഡ്യൂ ടു ഹാർട്ട് ഫെയിലിയർ ഡിസ്കഷൻ ഓൺ പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ഓബ്സ്ട്രക്ഷൻ ഓഫ് എ പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ബൈ എ നോൺ ഇൻഫെക്റ്റീവ് ത്രോംബസ് ഈസ് വാട്ട് വി മീൻ ബൈ പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് സൈസ് ഓഫ് ദി ത്രോംബസ് ഈസ് ഇമ്പോർട്ടൻറ്റ് ഇൻ ഡിസൈഡിംഗ് ദ മാനേജ്മെൻറ്റ് പെത്തോഫിസിയോളജി ഓഫ് പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് വൺ എൻഡോത്തീലിയൽ ഫാക്ടേഴ്സ് സ്യൂച്ചേഴ്സ് സോൺ എൻഡോത്തീലിയലൈസേഷൻ ഒക്കേഴ്സ് ഇൻ ത്രീ ടു ഫോർ വീക്സ് റിസ്ക് ഓഫ് ത്രോംബോസിസ് ഇസ് ഹയർ പ്രയർ ടു എൻഡോത്തീലിയലൈസേഷൻ ഇഫ് ആൻറ്റിക്വാഗ്ലേഷൻ ഇസ് സബ് ഒപ്റ്റിമൽ ടു ഹീമോഡൈനാമിക് ഫാക്ടേഴ്സ് ലോക്കലൈസ്ഡ് റീജൻ ഓഫ് ടേബിൾ ഇൻ ഫ്ലോ കോസസ് എൻഡോത്തീലിയൽ ട്രോമ ആൻഡ് ഡാമേജ് ടു ബ്ലഡ് സെൽസ് റിലീസിംഗ് എഡിനോസിൻ ഡൈ ഫോസ്വേറ്റ് വിച്ച് പ്രൊമോട്ട് പ്ലേറ്റ്ലെ ഡെഗ്രിഗേഷൻ ത്രീ കോഗ്ലേഷൻ ഫാക്ടേഴ്സ് പ്രീഡിസ്പോസിംഗ് ഫാക്ടേഴ്സ് ഫോർ പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ഇൻസഫിഷ്യൻറ്റ് ആൻറ്റിക്വാഗ്ലേഷൻ മൈട്രൽ ഓർ ട്രൈക്കസ്പെറ്റ് പൊസിഷൻ ഹൈപ്പർ കോഗ്ലബിൾ സ്റ്റേറ്റ് പ്രസൻസ് ഓഫ് അസോസിയേറ്റഡ് ഏട്രിൽ ത്രോംബസ് പാനസ് കെൻ ഒക്കർ അലോങ് വിത്ത് ത്രോംബസ് ആസ് വെൽ ബയോ പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് ഹാർട്ട് വാൾസ് ആർ എറ്റ് റിസ്ക് ഓഫ് ത്രോംബോസിസ് ഇൻ ദി ഇനീഷ്യൽ പീരീഡ് ആഫ്റ്റർ ഇംപ്ലാൻറ്റേഷൻ ടിൽ ദ ഗെറ്റ് എൻഡോത്തീലിയലൈസ്ഡ് മെക്കാനിക്കൽ പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് ഹാർട്ട് വാൾസ് ഹാവ് എ ലൈഫ് ലോങ് റിസ്ക് ഓഫ് പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ആൻഡ് ത്രോംബോംബോൾസം ആൻഡ് ഹെൻസ് നീഡ് ലൈഫ് ലോങ് ആൻറ്റിക്വാഗ്ലീഷൻ ട്രൈക്കസ്പിഡ് പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ഈസ് മോർ പ്രോൺ ഫോർ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ഡ്യൂ ടു ദി ലോ വെലോസിറ്റി ഓഫ് ബ്ലഡ് ഫ്ലോ മൈട്രൽ വാൾ ഹാസ് ഹയർ റിസ്ക് ദാൻ ആർട്ടിക് വാൾ ബിക്കോസ് ഓഫ് ദി ലോവർ ബ്ലഡ് ഫ്ലോ വെലോസിറ്റി അക്രോസ് ഇറ്റ് ക്ലിനിക്കൽ പ്രസൻറ്റേഷൻസ് വൺ ക്ലിനിക്കലി സൈലൻറ്റ് പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ടു പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് വിത്ത് എംബോളിക് എപ്പിസോഡ്സ് ലൈക്ക് സെറിബ്രൽ കൊറോണറി ഓർ പെർഫോംബോൾസം ക്യാൻ ഒക്കർ ഇൻ അപ് ടു ട്വൻറ്റി ഫൈവ് പെർസെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് കേസസ് ത്രീ ഹീമോഡൈനാമിക് പ്രോബ്ലം വിത്ത് എവിഡൻസ് ഓഫ് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ക്യാൻ പ്രസൻറ്റ് വിത്ത് ഫീവർ ഇൻ ദ സെറ്റിംഗ് ഓഫ് ഇൻഫെക്റ്റീവ് ആൻഡോക്കാർഡൈറ്റിസ് ഫീവർ ക്യാൻ ഒക്കർ ഇൻ പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ഈവൻ വിത്തൌട്ട് ആൻഡോക്കാർഡൈറ്റിസ് ഡയഗ്നോസിസ് ഓഫ് പ്രോസ്തറ്റിക് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ഹൈ റെസൊല്യൂഷൻ സൗണ്ട് സ്പെക്ട്രോഗ്രാഫ് ക്യാൻ ഡിറ്റക്റ്റ് വാൾ ത്രോംബോസിസ് ബൈ ദ ചേഞ്ച് ഇൻ വാൾ സൗണ്ട്സ് ദിസ് ഈസ് പ്രോബ്ലി സിമിലർ ടു സസ്പീഷൻ ഓഫ് ത്രോംബോസിസ് വൻ ഓഡിബിൾ വാൾ സൗണ്ട് ഇൻറ്റൻസിറ്റി ഡിക്രീസസ് ക്ലിനിക്കലി പേഷ്യൻസ് ആർ റുട്ടീൻലി ഇൻസ്ട്രക്റ്റഡ് ടു ലിസൺ ഫോർ ദി വാൾ സൗണ്ട്സ് ഇൻ എ ക്വയറ്റ് റൂം ആൻഡ് റിപ്പോർട്ട് ബാക്ക് ഇഫ് ദർ ഇസ് എ ഡിക്രീസ് ഇൻ ഇൻറ്റൻസിറ്റി സിനി ഫ്ലൂറോസ്കോപ്പി ഇസ് യൂസ്ഫുൾ ആസ് ഇറ്റ് ക്യാൻ ഡിറ്റക്റ്റ് ഡിക്രീസ് ലീഫ്ലെറ്റ് ആൻഡ് പോപ്പറ്റ് മൂവ്മെൻറ്റ് ആസ് വെൽ ആസ് അബ്നോമൽ മൂവ്മെൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദി വാൾ കേജ് ഷോർട്ട് വീഡിയോ ക്ലിപ്പിംഗ് ഫോളോസ് describing bileaflet prosthetic mitral valve on fluoroscopy bileaflet prosthetic mitral valve and a left coronary angiogram in the background the image shows the opening and closing of the mitral leaflets this is the ring of the mitral valve prosthetic mitral valve the leaflets are seen opening and closing two leaflets are seen in this view background shows coronary angiogram tiger catheter is seen in the left coronary ostium this is another view the ri caudal view earlier one was the lao caudal view here the wall ring is seen in a different plane you can see the coronary
better with transesophageal than transthoracic echocardiography. Gradients and valve areas can be estimated. Dimensionless obstruction indices are the ratio of subvalva to supravalvular velocities and velocity time integrals. Management of prosthetic valve thrombosis. If the thrombus in the prosthetic valve is less than 5 mm in size, only intravenous heparin is recommended. For larger thrombi, there are two options, thrombolysis versus surgical treatment. Thrombolysis has an initial success rate of 70 to 80 percent, but there is a 5 to 22 percent risk of embolism and 5 to 12 percent risk of disabling stroke. Thrombolysis is the preferred treatment for right-sided prosthetic valve thrombosis and small left-sided thrombi. Surgical treatment has a combined risk of death or stroke of 9 percent. In patients presenting with stroke, surgery is the first option as thrombolysis is contraindicated. You may wish to check out three more articles on my blog. Discussion on pulmonary hangout interval. Pulmonary hangout interval is a time taken for the actual pulmonary valve closure after the pulmonary artery and right ventricular pressure tracings crossover. Pressure crossover occurs when the right ventricle relaxes enough for the right ventricular pressure to fall below the pulmonary artery pressure. Hangout interval is more on the right side than on the left so that aortic hangout interval is shorter than the pulmonary hangout interval. This is because of much higher systemic vascular resistance compared to pulmonary vascular resistance. Pulmonary hangout interval is a measure of impedance of the pulmonary circulation. Pulmonary hangout interval varies from 30 to 120 milliseconds. Due to higher systemic vascular impedance, aortic hangout interval is 5 milliseconds or less. This difference causes splitting of second heart sound. In inspiration, pulmonary vascular impedance comes down and pulmonary hangout interval increases. This causes further delay of P2 and wider splitting of second heart sound in inspiration. Pulmonary hangout interval will shorten when there is pulmonary hypertension. P2 does not move with respiration in atrial septal defect because the right ventricular output and pulmonary hangout interval does not change with respiration in atrial septal defect. Pulmonary hangout interval does not change with respiration in AST because the pulmonary circulation is already overloaded by the left to right shunt. Right ventricular output does not change because the change in left to right shunt with respiration balances the change in right ventricular inflow due to change in venous return. In inspiration, when the venous return increases, left to right shunt across the atrial septal defect decreases and vice versa. This is the mechanism of wide fixed split in AST. The split is wide in AST because the right ventricular emptying is more prolonged due to the volume overload. Discussion on assessment of right ventricular function by echocardiography. Right ventricular systolic function can be evaluated in terms of right ventricular fractional area change and right ventricular ejection fraction. Right ventricular dp by dt or rate of rise of right ventricular pressure can be estimated from the tricuspid regurgitation jet. While the left ventricular dp by dt is over 1200 mm of mercury per second, that of the right ventricle is over 400 mm of mercury per second. Tricuspid annular plane systolic excursion is another measure of right ventricular systolic function. It is also known as TAPC. Fractional area change can be measured from single plane and biplane methods using the area length or Simpson's methods. Apical four-chamber and subcostal four-chamber views are useful for biplane evaluation. There are several limitations due to the geometry of the right ventricle. Right ventricular diastolic function can be evaluated from the tricuspid inflow pattern by Doppler interrogation. Hepatic venous Doppler and Doppler interrogation of right ventricular outflow tract are other methods of assessing right ventricular diastolic function. Right ventricle can be an open system in diastole with anti-grade forward flow into the pulmonary artery during atrial systole. During Doppler evaluation of right ventricle, 
the 5 to 10 percent increase in the measurements with inspiration has to be considered. This is applicable to pulmonary artery systolic velocity, tricuspid regurgitation velocity, and tricuspid inflow Doppler. This may lead to inability to detect small changes in status of the right ventricle. Right ventricular global function can be assessed by myocardial performance index and by three-dimensional echocardiography. Myocardial performance index is the ratio of the time spent in isovolumetric activity divided by the time spent in ventricular ejection. MPA is equal to IVCT plus IVRT divided by ET. IVCT isovolumic contraction time, IVRT isovolumic relaxation time, ET ejection time. Myocardial performance index has an inverse relation with global ventricular function in that increasing values indicate worsening global ventricular function. There is good correlation between Doppler derived myocardial performance index and cath derived invasive measures as well as with the clinical outcome. Myocardial performance index has different normal ranges for different age groups and for the left and right ventricles, though it is roughly a little more than one third. Advantages of myocardial performance index are that it is simple to estimate, reproducible, not affected by geometry, and assesses global function. Downsides of MPI are the non simultaneous acquisition, load dependence, variations with heart rate, age, and body surface area and rhythm as well as non-specific being unable to differentiate between systolic and diastolic dysfunction. There could also be pseudo normalization due to this. Longitudinal function of the right ventricle can be quantified by tissue Doppler methods. Longitudinal velocities assessed by tissue Doppler techniques are the lateral mitral analysis velocity, septal analysis velocity and the tricuspid analysis velocity. These tracings have distinct E and A in diastole, a systolic velocity, and spikes for isovolumetric contraction and relaxation. Tissue Doppler can quantify both systolic and diastolic myocardial function and is less load dependent. Early identification of right ventricular dysfunction and correlation with clinical function is feasible. Tissue Doppler technique can also assess radial function. Limitations of tissue Doppler include the angle dependence and confounding effects of cardiac tethering and translation. Regional function of the right ventricle can be noted by strain and strain rate imaging. Strain and strain rate imaging can also quantify both systolic and diastolic myocardial function and is less load dependent. Early identification of right ventricular dysfunction and correlation with clinical function is feasible as in the case of tissue Doppler imaging. Limitations of strain and strain rate imaging include the angle dependence, load dependence, aliasing, and problems with high frame rates and data analysis. There are a lot of challenges in the quantitative assessment of right ventricular function. The anatomy and function of the right ventricle is complex. Right ventricle has an inlet or sinus portion and an outlet or corners portion in addition to the body. The right ventricular fibers have more longitudinal shortening than radial shortening. Interactions between the right ventricle and the left ventricle include a shared wall, the interventricular septum, mutually encircling epicardial fibers, and a common pericardial space which causes restraint on the function of one chamber when the other is enlarged. Right ventricular physiology is quite different from that of the left ventricle though the output of both ventricles are equal in the absence of shunts. The right ventricle normally operates at a much lower pressure, pumping blood into the lower resistance pulmonary circuit so that the external work of the right ventricle is only about one-fourth of the left ventricle. Right ventricle functions more like a bellows and can give much output with less shortening due to the low impedance of the pulmonary vasculature. Right ventricle is a very efficient pump with ejection beginning very early during the pressure rise and continuing well beyond the peak right ventricular pressure even as the pressure falls. Right ventricular function assessment is quite important in recipients of orthotopic cardiac transplant. Right ventricular dilatation and failure can occur in early postoperative period
as a result of elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. Early recognition makes the treatment of this situation feasible with inhaled nitric oxide therapy. On the other hand, under recognition and lack of treatment can lead on to progressive deterioration of right ventricular function and sometimes early mortality. Even in those who eventually improve, residual right ventricular dysfunction may occur. Right ventricular myocardial injury can be related to donor brain death. Another important consideration in the transplanted heart is the likelihood of tricuspid regurgitation as the most common valvular lesion in the transplanted heart. Discussion on sinus node dysfunction and sinus node recovery time. Most frequent symptoms of sinus node dysfunction are syncope and presyncope. Other possible symptoms are fatigue, angina and shortness of breath. Elderly patients may present with subtle symptoms like gastrointestinal distress or a change in mental status. Symptoms can be intermittent and documentation can be difficult at times. Marked sinus bradycardia or pause may be asymptomatic occasionally. ECG rhythm strip documenting a long pause of around 8.5 seconds. Such long pauses would indicate suppression of sinus node activity and is a manifestation of sick sinus syndrome. Non-invasive methods of investigation include ECG, 24-hour Holter monitoring, exercise testing and autonomic testing. If symptoms are infrequent, invasive electrophysiologic testing or the use of an implantable loop recorder may be needed for documentation. Monitoring the ECG and correlating bradycardia during syncope is diagnostic of sinus node dysfunction, but this is rarely achieved from the simple ECG. If symptoms are frequent, a 24 or 48 hour ambulatory holter monitoring is useful. It is essential to document symptoms in a diary during holter monitoring for correlation. Futility of treating asymptomatic pauses must be borne in mind. Length of the pause has poor correlation with symptoms and prognosis. If symptoms are infrequent, a loop recorder, a home recording device or an implantable loop recorder is needed to pick up the pauses. Pharmacologic interventions or maneuvers test reflex responses of the heart rate. Carotid sinus massage causing pauses of more than 3 seconds is considered significant. Occasionally, such pauses may occur in asymptomatic elderly individuals. Intrinsic heart rate is the heart rate during complete autonomic blockade with atropine and propranolol. Intrinsic heart rate is calculated using the formula shown here. In a case of clinical bradycardia, a low IHR suggests intrinsic sinus nodal dysfunction while a normal IHR indicates abnormal autonomic regulation. Invasive testing is reserved for symptomatic patients whose bradycardia cannot be documented by non-invasive means. Sinus node recovery time and sinoatrial conduction time are measured. But the ability to provide a definitive diagnosis by these parameters is limited. Concomitant AV nodal disease is seen in about 17% of the patients with sinus node dysfunction. New AV conduction abnormalities develop at a rate of 2.7% per year. Derivatives of sinus node recovery time Sinus node recovery time is measured by overdrive atrial pacing for 30 seconds and noting the time required for recovery of sinus node activity after cessation of pacing. Overdrive pacing is done at different cycle lengths in sequence. The interval from the last pace beat to the next spontaneous sinus beat is taken as the sinus node recovery time. SNRT is the longest time measured at any of the different pacing cycle lengths. If there is a subsequent longer pause, it is known as a secondary pause. When the sinus cycle length prior to pacing is subtracted from the sinus node recovery time, we get the corrected sinus node recovery time. CSNRT is usually less than 550 milliseconds. The time taken for the sinus rate to reach the rate prior to pacing is taken as the total recovery time. Total recovery time is usually less than 5 seconds. Asymptomatic bradycardia 
ഓർ പോസസ് വിത്ത് നോ അസോഷിയേറ്റഡ് എപ്പിസോഡ്സ് ഓഫ് ഏട്രൽ ഫുബ്ലേഷൻ നീഡ്സ് നോ ട്രീറ്റ്മെൻറ്റ് ഇൻ സിംറ്റമാറ്റിക് പേഷ്യൻസ് വിത്ത് സൈനസ് നോഡൽ ഡിസ്ഫങ്ഷൻ ആൻഡ് ഏട്രൽ ഫുബ്ലേഷൻ തെറാപ്പി ഡിപ്പെൻഡ്സ് ഓൺ വെദർ സിംറ്റംസ് ആർ റിലേറ്റഡ് ടു ദി ടാക്കി കാഡിയ ഓർ ബ്രാഡി കാഡിയ വെരി ലോങ് പോസ് നോട്ടഡ് ഓൺ ഐ സി യു സെൻട്രൽ മോണിറ്റർ ഓഫ് അബൌട്ട് എയ്റ്റ് സെക്കൻഡ്സ് ആൻഡ് ടു മോർ പോസസ് ഓഫ് അറൌണ്ട് ടു സെക്കൻഡ്സ് ക്യാൻ ബി സീൻ ഇൻ ദ ട്രേസിംഗ് ദ അണ്ടർലൈൻ റിതം ഇസ് ഏട്ടർ ഫുബ്ലേഷൻ ദ പോസസ് ആർ ഫോളോഡ് ബൈ ഏട്ടർ ഫുബ്ലേഷൻ വിത്ത് ഫാസ്റ്റ് വെൻട്രിക്കുലർ റേറ്റ് ഓവറോൾ ദിസ് സ്യൂട്ട്സ് എ ഡയഗ്നോസിസ് ഓഫ് ടാക്കി ബ്രാഡി സിൻഡ്രോം ആൻഡ് വാറൻറ്റ്സ് എ പെർമനൻറ്റ് പേസ് മേക്കർ പ്രൊവൈഡഡ് എ റിവേഴ്സിബിൾ കോസ് ക്യാൻ ബി എക്സ്ക്ലൂഡഡ് capturing such a record obviates the need for holter monitoring in this case long term anticoagulation has to be considered if the chad stu score is high pacing is useful to prevent bradycardia drugs known to depress sinus node function should be stopped or backup pacing will be needed anticoagulation should be considered for atrial fibrillation Sinus node dysfunction is the most common indication for permanent pacemaker implantation. Atrial pacing can decrease incidence of atrial fibrillation. Symptomatic patients should be considered for dual chamber pacemaker implantation. Ventricular pacing is considered for patients with chronic atrial fibrillation. Atrial pacemaker may be enough if the AV conduction is intact. Occurrence of new AV conduction abnormalities develop at a rate of 2.7% per year. and must be borne in mind while planning purely atrial pacing rate adaptive pacing and mode switching are important functions which could be useful